Hi, Kernetex here with the next in a series of videos about installing Linux from scratch 10.0 on a Raspberry Pi 400. So um, we've installed the system now. Um, all that's left to do, we've configured the system, created a few um, configuration files for the network and such like, localization. Um, all we need to do now is to make the system bootable and that involves configuring um, the file system table, the etcfs tab file, and generating a kernel that the system can be booted with. Um, as I've mentioned previously, don't use grub. Um, the Raspberry Pi uses a kind of specialized um, booting system. I, I'm assuming it's because it's like a, a bit like a mobile phone. It's kind of like an embedded device where it has one purpose in life. Um, whereas a PC is kind of generic. It's got various um, things and ways it can boot from. So you can boot from hard disk, a floppy disk, a CD-ROM, um, any sort of USB device that can be plugged in, uh, a PCI device, and so on, a SATA device, a PASA device, SCSI device, etc., etc. So uh, a PC is a bit more of a generic thing to boot from, hence the need for um, boot sequences that are um, flexible. Uh, so the Raspberry Pi is, uh, well, it derives from a kind of mobile phone uh, design. Um, where it, it does one thing in life, although it's trying to be a, um, a compute, computable device. Um, so therefore, the way it boots, it, it, um, I, I don't know the detail, the ins and outs specifically, but it, it looks for specific files on, on the first partition of the uh, specified disk. Um, and it has to be formatted to... Um, VFAT, which is FAT32, 32, uh, 32 bit FAT um, uh, file system. Um, and that's basically it, it just looks for a specific named kernel, loads it, um, it uses a file to um, identify what um, things to enable or to send to the kernel, and that's that's really it. So what I'll do when I, sh when I come to actually booting is show how to boot uh, by using the default Raspberry Pi boot partition. So not making any changes um, apart from installing a new kernel. And then I'll show how we can um, divorce the new Linux from scratch system completely from the host system by um, using, creating and using our own boot partition. Um, something, I'm not sure if Raspberry Pi, uh, Raspberry Pi 4 does it, I assume it does, um, it's capable of booting from a USB port, whereas the earlier Pi's, I'm not sure about Raspberry Pi 3, but certainly the early Pi's couldn't um, boot from USB at all. Um, so that's why we're able to do this. So for example, the Raspberry Pi 1, it had to boot from the SD card. There's no other way of booting. Um, I'm not sure if there's a network boot or not. Um, I haven't used it in a long time, so I don't, don't know for sure. But uh, the Raspberry Pi 400 is capable of booting from the SD card from the USB device or, or the network boot as well. Um, so, yeah, maybe talking a little bit ahead of myself there, but let's... Uh, Get on with doing the FS tab file, and then perhaps we can look at that, and maybe uh, maybe some other things to talk about. So um, I've I'm in my true environment, so everything's um, as it was yesterday, and I'm now going to create this file here. Um, which is like a kind of default file, but we need to edit it um, to make it compatible with our system. 
So you don't really want to touch these virtual file systems to get mounted. So leave them alone. Um, the ones we're particularly interested in are the swap and the root partition. So let's start with the root partition. If we just come out of this for a moment, do an fdisk minus l slash dev slash sda to remind ourselves of um, Oh, right, looks like I've forgotten to mount my virtual file systems. Right, okay, let me do that first. So I'll just go down to the root. Mount the dev. And I'll just quickly run these in. Yep, that's all good, no problems there. And I'll return to the truth and I'll retry that command. That's better. Um, so as you can see, we've got a, I've reserved partition one for when we actually create the boot partition so that we can boot with just the hard disk and don't need the SD card. Um, I've got the swap as SDA2 and the root as SDA3, so if I just bear that in mind while I go back to the FS tab, I'll start with the swap, that's dev SDA2. Um, insert. Um, now, it may be an idea to use um, UUIDs, I've, I've found they're becoming more and more useful um, as time goes on. Previously, personally, I found that um, partition assignments never really changed hardly ever. Um, and if you do do a modification, then you're aware of it. You just changed the new designation, you know, for example, from SDA2 to SDA4 or whatever the change was. Um, but with the use, I find I'm using more and more pluggable devices, either USB sticks or external drives and so on. And you don't know what allocation the kernel is going to give in terms of the SD uh, designation, dev SD designation. Um, you could unplug something and then plug something else in and then plug a third device in and um, basically the letters get allocated sequentially down. Um, I've also found if you have a problem with a disk, like some sort of hard problem, an error or something, and it locks out for some reason, you have to unplug it, then that letter is, is reserved and it's not in use anymore because obviously it's been locked to that device that had the problem. So um, I'm finding that the UUID method of accessing uh, partitions is uh, becoming much more um, beneficial. So with that in mind, what I'm going to do next is to find out what the UUID for dev SDA2 is for the swap device. And I need to put it, that in after this string. So it specifies the unique, it's like a signature if you've not heard of this. I, I can't remember what it stands for, unique, universal, universal unique ID, something like that. Um, and it's basically a, a, a signature that's generated that should be unique for this partition and the number of digits and letters in it is so numerous that the chances of an identical uh, string being generated are you know, astronomical, probably more than astronomical. Um, so that's why it's able to be called a unique ID um, as that, that number will be just purely for that device or partition. So I'm going to save that and we can use a program called block ID and then you specify the device you want to find out the um, UUID for. So I want to find out what the swap partition is and as you can see it says that uh, for the device that I put in that's the UUID string there. So I'll copy that and handily, quite helpfully, it tells us what type of um, 
swap uh, sorry what type of uh, device it is and it's, you can see there it says it's a swap uh, partition the part UUID is a partition UUID um, and I'll come on to that you can't rely on that being unique and I'll um, I'll mention that mention why that is not a unique number when we come to look at booting from the um, booting the Linux from scratch from the hard disk because we'll, we'll be needing that um, but for the moment um, uh, we're just interested in the UUID so I've highlighted that so that should be copied into the center click buffer of the mouse so I'll bring back me um, FS tab I'll get back the insert and I'll just center click and paste that and that should be all that's required to set that up. You can, if you like, remove some of this white space to get everything on the same line. Unfortunately, unless you've got a wider terminal, as you can see, it does uh, mess up the tabular format of the um, FS tab file. But I think that's a small price to pay for the flexibility that using a UUID gives you. Likewise, we'll do the same with the root partition. So I'll just pre-insert the UUID there and that's where it's going to be mounted so we want to mount it at the root and this bit here is the file system type so we've formatted that as ext4 so I'll just stick that in there so let's do block ID for the third partition which is our root partition and you can see this time it doesn't tell it, obviously it does tell us what type it is, a ext4 again and it also interestingly tells us the block size so that's the default sector size if you like that's how many bytes will be transferred in the smallest chunk so again I'll highlight that, I could just double click that number and it highlights it automatically get the FS tab back, put the cursor back to where we want to insert this, press the I center click and there's the UUID for the root partition so once again I'll just put this back in a kind of tabular format as best I can remembering to leave at least a little bit of white space in between each column so that is the minimum that we need to um, boot from. In fact what I might do is just so that we've got access to it automatically is I'll also add in the boot partition that we're going to use which is on the SD card and now I can mention about the part UUID and why it's not unique. Um, the reason why I mentioned part UUID is because that's how the um, Raspberry Pi boot. So if I look at the, uh, I'll have to go to another tab actually. If I display the real Raspberry Pi FS tab, you'll see it uses the part UUID to um, reference partitions. Now the reason why this is not unique is because this suffix here is the same as the partition number so if I did fdisk minus l dev mmc which is the device that the SD card is on okay I haven't got access to that so let's try that instead um, yeah you can see there's two partitions on the SD card Partition 1 and Partition 2 is designated by that P1 and P2 and you can see the two partitions, the boot which is the first FAT32 partition is dash 01 and that um, ties up with the P1 partition 1 the O2 ties up with the P2 and you can see the prefix of the UU, partition UUID is identical in both cases indicating it's the same device and it's only the suffix designator that um, identifies uniquely each partition. Likewise if I looked at uh, our hard disk 
we've got three partitions there. If I was to do block ID on dev STA, all the partitions. Um, right, it hasn't come up with the first partition, which is the boot partition that I was going to format because it's unformatted. There's nothing about it, so it hasn't generated a UUID for that. But you can see the second partition, which is swap. See, SDA2 has got a suffix of 02, and SDA3 has got a suffix of 03. So if, for example, I was to um, create another swap partition, uh, SDA4 and make SDA2 uh, a data partition. The swap partition is now not um, SDA2, it's SDA4, and therefore the suffix for that would be SDA4, so it's changed. Um, granted, the UUID would have changed, but normally when you're moving things around, you, you replicate things. Um, if you're creating it again from scratch, then you'd know that you'd need a new UUID anyway. But if, for example, you use GParted to shuffle these around, um, the UUID will remain the same, but the partition number would, would change or could change. So that's why it's not genuinely unique. But because Raspberry Pi uses it, um, I'm going to stick with it. So we need all of this information here to add to our own FS tab. So I'll just go back here, go back into it, um, go into this blank line here, just press enter and add a new one. I'll add the UUID, in fact I don't think you need to part bit, I think just that UUID works. And we want to tell it to mount it on boot. And also we need to tell it that it's a VFAT type file system want to mount it with default options, so defaults and the dump order is 0 and the file system check should be 2 so that should be sufficient to boot, we didn't need the um, this line I've just put in the boot but what it does it will mount the boot partition for us so it's ready for um, uh, use um, yes that's right so we'll have access to the files in there when, when we first boot so it's just a convenience thing it's not necessary to actually boot the Linux from scratch system um, uh, for, for how we're going to boot it initially so I think that's all we need to do there so just to get that up again that's our FS tab. So we've got our boot partitions going to be mounted at boot. And if we look at boot at the moment, it's empty. So it's ready for an empty directory, ready to have that mounted. Um, we've got our root UUID, which if we do the block ID command again on dev STA, all the partitions there, just confirm. Oh, this one, so this must be maybe because it's a updated version, a newer version than the one that's on the Raspberry Pi operating system or maybe because the one on the Raspberry Pi operating system has been modified um, this is actually giving us the part U UID um, for the empty partition, the one that's not been formatted yet as you can see here but you can see for the actual disk SDA, that partition or, or I don't know what PTU UID is, um, you can see it's been replicated everywhere it's just the suffix again that's changing. But the important bit is that um, for now, the important bit is that the swap partition, which is this one here, has got this unique ID 1E99 it starts and there it is, the swap partition and the root partition, which is this one beginning DCA 9BA is UID there and then these ones are what we've copied from the LFS book so they're all the virtual file systems that we mounted at boot. Some more information there about if you're using um, uh, X3 to, uh, about various other options and character sets and so on 
if you're using NCQ um, Web2, um, add the uh, barrier option and so on. Um, and also if you decide to use LVM then you cannot use the barrier option. So that's the file system tab. That's quite a critical component. If you get anything wrong there then you'll, you won't be able to boot. And this is why I'm doing the booting stages so that um, if there's any problems we should be able to um, go back to the Raspberry Pi operating system and uh, boot from that. Basically if uh, we get anything wrong here um, and it locks us out, all we need to do is unplug the external disk and the Raspberry Pi operating system should boot by default. So let's move on to the next part which is building the Linux kernel. Now if you remember um, not only did we not use the grub tarball, we didn't use the vanilla, the plain uh, Linux tarball which comes from the kernel.org site. We're using the Raspberry Pi one. The reason why is the Raspberry Pi has got some modifications on, uh, with it specifically for the Raspberry Pi. It allows us to install um, additional files and so on. So the instructions we use here we take with a pinch of salt. Um, if I extract the file first of all, uh, what was it called? Our Raspberry Pi kernel, that's it. So I'll just extract that first. The only thing I really do here that's not mentioned on the instructions from the Raspberry Pi Foundation to, to do is to clean the um, source directory. Um, it's something that's recommended um, to be done as it says here the kernel team recommends it so it's something I'll do anyway um, don't worry about it. you're not going to delete anything um, important so I'm going to go in the kernel make MR proper Mr. Proper and that's the only bit I'm going to do that's in this page um, don't need to worry about um, anything here because uh, this is as I say a um, custom version of the kernel specifically for the Raspberry Pi so everything's been set um, uh, in place all you need to do is just basically build it um, don't have to do anything else all the modules that are available or required well in fact it's like a, a default build of the kernel everything gets uh, built as a module um, the only thing that's missing is firmware to make things work such as the wireless and so on um, but that's out of scope of this really um, we're only interested in getting the Raspberry Pi up and running um, not making it completely feature uh, feature activated all the features activated so um, that's something to do later on with Beyond Linux from scratch so yeah, I'm not going to look at anything else in there. What I'm going to do is go back to the Raspberry Pi building a kernel page. Um, hopefully you can see the... Um, does that make that any bigger if I... No, it doesn't increase the um, size of the address. But if you search for Raspberry Pi building kernel or kernel building, you'll, you'll find this page quite easily. Um, they say to uh, get the latest from Git but as you saw when we we're downloading these source tarballs in the um, first few videos that um, I downloaded from the GitHub hub repository just download a one of the releases um, you can see this one's dated what's that first of February um, there may even be a new one now possibly depending on how often they release them no that's still the latest one so yeah two weeks ago that was Let's just refresh that. Yeah, so that is still the the most recent version, and you can see there's a uh, a tarball there to download, which is the one that um, I downloaded. There's another link there as well. So apart from that, um, we just follow the instructions here. Um, it says as well as the default configuration, you may wish to configure kernel in more detail 
I can't think you'd need to do that unless you had some specific hardware that you'd want to wanted to get working um, under Linux from scratch. Um, really, all you need to do is to follow these instructions. Uh, Raspberry Pi 4, okay, I'm on a 400, but it's effectively a, a Raspberry Pi 4. So these are the instructions I need to follow. So CD Linux, that's into the source directory. We're already there. Um, well, the directory is different, but the directory name is different, but that doesn't matter. All we do is copy this line here. So this specifies the uh, type of kernel that's going to be built uh, for what model. And then we run this command here to make bcm2711 def config. So this is generate, generating a default config file for this particular processor or um, silicon on chip BCM2711 which is what's in the Raspberry Pi 4 and 400. Now the next thing is quite important um, it's to go into the kernel menu and modify um, one of the lines in the config file now it looks like they're actually telling us to do this by modifying dot config it's um, always never been recommended uh, to modify the dot config directly because um, it can be changed by the uh, any of the config programs that the kernel gets packaged with um, the best way to do it that's probably a quick way to do it but the best way to do it is to uh, use the graphical um, menu editor um, which I'll show you in a moment. There's several editors you can use, but the um, NCURSES one is probably the easiest one to use. So to do that, you do make menu config. And just give it a little while while it prepares some scripts. Okay, I've got caught out up again by this. See, it says here that the display must be 19 lines long and 80 columns wide now. I thought this was actually 80 columns. Oh, it was actually 79. Okay. I didn't check properly that I had set it to be big enough. So, okay, it's 80 columns now. I guess the reason for that is to make sure that everything fits on the screen correctly. Um, as the kernel's quite critical, you don't want things missing. So, there's the menu. We just need to go into general setup as it says there down there so it's the first option you press enter and it's this option here we need to change so as you can see the minus v7l indicates that this kernel is being built for the arm v7 the l's for the little endian by ordering um, and we just need to attach something say um, for example kernel text kernel something like that uh, I don't know what limitations there are on the string. I've put some quite long ones in, probably about two or three times the size of what you can see on the screen, and there doesn't seem to be any problem. Although, obviously, you might get wraparounds or uh, the end of the string being dropped off if it's too long. So, yeah, like I said, I'm not sure what the longest is. I don't even know, know if the uh, help will tell you. Oh, 64 characters, so it's, it's quite a few characters. So let me put that back in again. In fact, I'll put this in capital so it stands out. And I'll just press enter there. And you can see it, it confirms the new string there. And all we do is press the um, tab button to move to the exit button at the bottom. Press enter, tab again press enter and then press enter again to save those changes and if you want to check that those changes have been made you can grep for the string you've put in so for example if I grep for my name there kernel text in dot config uh, it hasn't found it why is that Okay, let's try that another way. Oh, that's interesting. It's not in there. Um, 
Right, let me go back and check. It's still there. Oh, okay. I can't spell my name. That's why I didn't find it. That's better. I'll learn to spell my name one day. Okay, so if I recall the grep command, so I'm grepping for my name. There it is there. So you can see that the option that's been configured is local version and that's the string it's going to be and it's exactly the same as the um, option that's in the page. So to build it, I'm going to time this because it'll take um, a little while. Um, probably about 20 to 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes. I can't remember exactly how long this takes, but it does take quite a while. These are the targets it's going to build. Z image, create the kernel. Modules, create the modules. And these DTPs, I can't remember what they stand. Oh, there it says there. Device tree blobs. These are binary blobs that are required to make devices work, basically. So it's kind of like firmware, if you like. Um, so there's three different targets that Make's going to build. So it's quite a lot of work for it to do. So press enter here and get it building and like I say within a roughly half an hour or so um, it should be complete.
Okay, so that has finished compiling after a lot longer than I thought it would take. Um, hour and ten minutes. But we've now got a kernel that we can install with the remaining commands on the web page. So the first one installs the modules into the um, file system. So this is in the Linux from scratch system. Uh, okay, yes, of course we don't need sudo because we are the root. Okay, it's done so all that remains is to copy files into the correct locations now the first one here you can see it's um, copying stuff into the boot our boot is unformatted we haven't mounted it but we need to mount the one that's on the SD card so um, okay why has that not worked did it actually need to be part UID um, oh, I know what it is. It's the wrong format. Um, so let's just edit the FS tab. Um, yeah, this needs to be, I'm not sure if uppercase matters but the um, don't actually need this partition name um, and I think these need to be in capitals as well off the top of my head I'm not sure if this matters or not but um, when I did my testing I had these in capitals so I can't be sure um, for certain to advise you whether they're uh, the lowercase or uppercase matters um, I'm just gonna double check that number uh, P1 Okay. Yeah, P one. Um, right, and in fact, I've used the wrong one. It should be this UUID. This is why I've used this UUID. That's right, because the output was in capitals. So the the um, UUID I've used is actually the one for the hard disk. Um, So, right. Yes, I've used. Uh, oh no, it is correct. 997C. Um, right, now I'm getting a pickle here. This is where it can get quite confusing. Right, the one I definitely want is this one, irrespective of what I've put in. So, that's the one I'm going to copy. Uh, I don't know what I was doing with the other one. So I'll get rid of that and I'm going to paste it in exactly as it appeared. So that is correct to so load the SD card um, boot partition, uh, which is this one here. You can see it's even got a label on there. I don't think that's important. Um, oh, that's the that's what I copied that I shouldn't have copied. Um, and it even says part UUID, knowing that UUID is the correct tag. So, yeah, what I said earlier on, ignore that bit. It is this bit here we're interested in. So, that's a good job I noticed that. It wouldn't have um, worked. So, okay, so now we can mount the B. 
boot partition. That should work. And if we look at the boot partition now, you can see these files are the files that um, are, well, you can see the date there, that, that one there, 1980, hasn't got a date on it. These are the files that are used by, uh, or been created by the Raspberry Pi. I guess they're February the 5th, because that's probably the date that I created this image to um, boot the Pi from initially before I started recording the demonstration. So that's good. So we're going to overwrite these files here. Now there normally shouldn't be any problem with this. You may want to take a backup in the first place. You'll notice that the kernel, or if you remember the kernel we've got is the V7L. So this is the kernel image that's going to be overwritten. Um, some of the other files are going to be overwritten as well, such as these DTB files. But as I say, there shouldn't be a problem with this. It's all automated. Um, the only caveat that may be because we've had errors with the compilation that may produce some rubbish um, but as I said in testing that I didn't have these problems so um, it's up to you whether you want to do a backup or not but uh, I don't consider it absolutely necessary so that's copied out so if I do a listing now you'll see the date change where oh sorry this minus L on the boot directory You'll see where the files have been updated. So there you go. These DTBs have been updated with ones we've just compiled. Um, they actually look smaller. Um, yeah, they're actually smaller. So I'm not sure what the significance of that is. Maybe they compress better. Um, the kernel is roughly the same. That's six six put six point six seven megabytes. The previous one that was originally there. Oh, it looks like it's actually the same it looks at six six seven four zero eight eight. So, oh uh, no, sorry, we haven't uh, copied that over yet. Okay, so that's the last step. Let's do the other bits that need to be done. And there's a readme there to copy as well. And finally the kernel, because we're using an environment variable, let's just double check that that variable still exists and has got something sensible in it. It has. So we'll just finally copy the kernel. And now after listing on the boot, we should find that the kernel is slightly, ever so slightly bigger, 668 instead of 667. So... Um, could be because we're using more recent kernel, maybe a little bit of extra code in there. And that is more or less it as far as the kernel is concerned. So if we now go back to the Linux from scratch book, we can move on and just uh, finish up. Um, like I say, you probably don't need to uh, rescue the... What we've just done is fairly safe. As long as you didn't get any errors, um, we can move on to the end.